how are algorithms, big data, and platforms such as Netflix reshaping the way we watch films and series? Is there still such a thing as individual taste in a day and age where every online step we take is analyzed? Has the internet truly democratized consumption and production? And what happens to niche markets, such as this film festival, in what is described as the age of the blockbuster? I'm going to talk to two guests about this. Payal Arora, associate professor at the Department of Media and Communication and author of The Next Billion user, life, a digital life beyond the West, and Philip Vermeijle, professor of global art markets. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks for being here. Paya, let me start with you. What is the series you have been binge watching lately? Oh God, I've been binging so often that I keep forgetting the you know the next one. So uh, this might that's be the whole character this? of binging, isn't okay, it? Okay, okay. So it all becomes a blur. Um, Gracie and Frankie, actually, Grace and Frankie. Grace and Frankie. Okay. Yeah, which some... is really kind of disturbing because it's like old ladies, and so I'm not that old, but um, that says a lot about disrupting audiences, right? So. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Philippe, uh, what have you been watching lately? Um, not sure about lately, a but the one... closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, the ones I binged watched is uh, definitely The Handmaid's Tale, which was a good series, Tale. but it was okay. not on Netflix, I believe. It I, isn't. I had a DVD. It is fabulous. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. By the but way, I thought it was yeah. a great series. Yeah. yeah. Um, you are doing a project together uh, called the Cultural, the New Cultural Commons, looking at the role of the middleman and gatekeeper, critics, and whether this is changing in the digital age. Um, to start out with with Netflix, to what extent has has uh, are you happy that Netflix has entered your life? Well, you know, I mean, I think we are paradoxical creatures, really, because on one hand, we, being researchers, being no, we people, we as being, consumers, okay. as media consumers, because on one hand, we are so craving for predictability, we so want technology to know us, you know, the whole personalization. So it's very thrilling that life can be really predictable. On the other hand, we so want novelty and change. So the question is, we are constantly in this circular dilemma of loving and hating Netflix, right? And Netflix being uh, bringing you predictability or bringing you... It brings you, you know, the, the thing is, it's always, there's this question, when will Netflix recommend Roma to me? Why is it always recommending some B-grade or C-grade show? Is because my Because you're taste... watching Grey's and Frank. Exactly, right? See, so you start to wonder. Recommend Roma to me, just, you know. <laughs> 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 Such a snob, yeah. Um, <laughs> Philip, uh, has Netflix made your media consumption more diverse? Um, you know, it holds the promise of having, you know, a more, a much wider choice, of much, much more diversity, same as Spotify. You think like, wow, I can really discover new things. But what, it turn, what turns out is that because, because of their very clever um, recommendation system, recommendation um, algorithms, it steers us towards you know, what's very popular, to what other people have seen, uh, to uh, very often their own productions or series or films uh, with which they have a contract with the rights holder. So there's a, even a, a question of collusion. Also because they know that basically people want to watch what other people are watching. What I want most is to watch the movie that Pyle has seen because then we can talk about it. Well, and you don't, and you don't <laughs> manage to do this. <laughs> but uh, it, so it has, has, has made your media consumption more diverse or not? Let me just say it has the potential of making it more diverse and we have more access at any time that we want, whether it's on our phone or whether we're abroad, whether we're traveling. Mm -hmm. um, but I find that it's, to be honest, I'm, I'm and to the millennials, you know, I am, I am of the older generation, thereby, thereby somewhat um, old fashioned. I used to go to a video library where you could rent movies and I'm still finding that today I had more of a choice there you know, I remember in Antwerp, it was a great place called Video Library where, uh, you could, where it was an Ukrainian movie section. So there was more room for serendipitous discovery, which I find much more difficult to do uh, on Netflix. Was there really, was it really easier to, to expect, for example, this is diversity as well, right? Yeah, but I think people, you know, and economists talk about search costs and so forth. People in a sense are also lazy. They want to be, they don't have time to sift through all the clutter. There is a mass of stuff out there. They want to hear from their friends or from some, uh, or, or um, an algorithm telling them, hey, maybe if you like this, you, sh you, you may also uh, want to watch this thing. Uh, Amazon perfected that by, you know, starting with the books. You know, if you read this book, other people uh, also like that one. So yes, we have. There's a the potential. We have 
potentially we can venture out, find um, you know, other things that nobody's watching. But the, the statistics show that people don't really do that. You know, even 2016, you know, thousands of movies have come out in that year. The five, in terms of box office, the five top movies all were produced by Disney. Now, why is that? You know, there's a concentration taking place. Because the promise was, once, Chris Anderson, I think, is the author who wrote The, the Long Tail, yeah. uh, promising that the small production uh, pr productions would, would come up, the small products that did it. It, it, it wouldn't be the blockbusters uh, that would be big sellers in, in the digital age, but it would be the small production. This has turned out to be false, right? Well, the, the long tail really still exists. In fact, you know, it's very long, but it's also very skinny. And you know what? Nothing happens there. And that when you read up about Spotify, it's, yeah, they have 12 million songs or 15 million, I don't even know. And they're saying a lot of songs are being listened to, but a lot of them are not. Millions don't have a zero hit, and so, uh, many other millions just one. So what does that tell us? That means that Yes, it is possible for each and one of us to put something on YouTube or maybe on Spotify. We can all be producers. We can all be producers because the cost of producing stuff, thanks to technology, has really gone down. So that is an amazing potential right, worldwide. The problem is, how do you get noticed? And that is much more difficult in the algorithms and... Um, you know, the, and the big companies and so forth. Yeah. But, you know, it's, it's very easy to begin, become cynical. It's also mm -hmm. a bit trendy to be cynical about the way we are being made slaves of the algorithm. We are stupid consumers toyed around by Netflix. To what extent do you share this, this, this cynicism? Um, I'm not cynical at all in that sense. I'm always euphoric about uh, change, but I'm also skeptical about our hype and expectation that's going to solve everything because the problems we have about Netflix are the problems we've had with previous, like whether it was the television or the radio, it's the same kind of conversations we've been having. Because the truth is that no technology is going to transform our, in our taste, our life in entirety. It's about our social circles. It's about our agency, you know, because... And we, we are, were full of this expectation. No, because we're junkies at heart, right? Like, all of us, our instincts are to go for junk food, right? And so to be healthy, you have to be proactive and say, you know what? I've been binging too much on potato chips. I need to have a diversity of, you know, kind of the kinds of food. It's good for me. I need to open my mind. And that agency was there in the past, is there today, and it will always be there. And we always need to work at it, right? So, um, but, you know, I mean, in terms of, like, this diversity, I mean, I was just thinking about, um, I come from India, and... Um, I just saw on Netflix the other day a, a series called Lust Stories, right? Now, you're talking about this long tail, and I was thinking, when I was growing up in India, there's no way. Firstly, you can't even kiss. I remember seeing a Hindi movie, and I think the actors came close to kissing, and the sun set, and the birds flew, and they're like, oh, my God, right? And now the Lust story is all about sex with servants and, you know, teachers having sex with their students, and... Who's the audience, right? And this is because there's a huge subculture, and this is a long tail, right? There's a subculture, which is the Indian diaspora, and there's a rising middle class, well, with closeted views on sexuality, because you can't express it so easily, mm -hmm. but they're the ones consuming it, and you can see the statistics, which is encouraging, right? So you were saying here that, that platforms like Netflix have a very huge emancipating, emancipating role in, in the, maybe mainly in developing countries, or... I think, I think in terms of, you know, there's a push away from Americanization in some ways, because think about it, like you have Dark from Germany, right? You have actually these rising series from Mexico, you have from, so Still, for a you change, were watching Grace and Frankie. <laughs> well, there you go. Also, talk about demographic change. When, you know, I, I think the last time we had uh, older senior citizens as the main characters was Golden Girls or something, right? And then here you have, and by the way, who are consuming Grace and Frankie is not older people necessarily. This is a, uh, there was a nice line from Netflix that they said, all that we know about, you know, from sociologists about gender and age and all the sort of census demographics, we're going to throw in the garbage bin because the people we thought are watching should be watching certain shows are not. So there's a lot of closeted watching because we feel like it's just me and the algorithm, right? Yeah. So. And, One of, and also yep. just to add on that on the positive, 
um, you know, there was an article this week in the, in, the, in the Economist saying that internet, people having access to a smartphone with internet connection rose from what was 136 million to 400 million in India last year. That means that all these people have access to platforms like Netflix or something similar like that and Spotify. That in itself is an amazing feat, you know, that people have, you know, whether in the rural areas or not, whether they're, you know, also among the poor, they can actually participate in this kind of sort of global culture, if you will. Yeah. Um, you're specialized in, in the art markets, Philip. Uh, to what extent has the art market been reshuffled in, in the same way that Netflix and Spotify and YouTube have been uh, uh, reshuffling those uh, markets? Well, there I'm a bit more skeptical, or you know, the art market is a different ball game. We're not talking about popular culture with about mov like movies and, and music and so forth, easily reproducible. We're very often talking about unique pieces, um, let's say paintings, um, you know, which responds to a very different dynamic. The art market system as we know it has been in place for several centuries. Christie's and Sotheby's were founded in the 18th century. And I don't see a lot of evidence today that even with digitization and so forth, that whole world has been turned upside down. That's mm -hmm. been the project Pyle and I have been involved in. We see that the same kind of intermediaries or the need for intermediaries is still very strong, yeah. particularly because there is so much stuff out there and people don't know what to choose. And what is good art? You know, it's very difficult for a lot of people, at least for me, to answer. So we have to rely on a dealer or a curator to a great extent to still answer that question for us. And so I don't see a huge watershed there at the moment. At least, okay. you know, mm -hmm. uh, um, the, the, this watershed was promised uh, in, in the field of uh, audiovisual uh, production and consumption. Is maybe this, this sector as conservative as the art market? Or is, it, is, is there a watershed going on over there? Well, if you're talking about the media industries, right? Mm. Uh, yeah, I mean, look, I mean, obviously the art world was never seeking to be democratic because it's, mm. it's all about being elitist. I mean, being democratic is like the very antithesis of the art market. So I, in my previous life, I used to be an art dealer. So actually that's how we connected because I left that all behind, became a media scholar. And then when we both met, we were like, hey, hang on, what's going on? Because when I was an art dealer in San Francisco in the 90s, email was a major thing. You're like, oh my God, that's so democratic, right? Like we're sending it, maybe we'll impact the aura of the art by sending a JPEG on email. And so, you know, decades later, the two of us meet and we're like, what's happened? Has the art world changed much? And there, it has actually in many ways. There's a number of platforms, right? Like the uh, like art platforms, like Artsy, Artnet, where artists can go directly on board, just like Spotify, right? Well, although it's Spotify, mind you, there's a biggest myth here because there's this idea that, um, you know, the middlemen have disappeared, but Spotify has been instrumental in giving a new lease to life for the music industry because you can't get on Spotify without like a label, right? So actually it gave them relevance and it actually consolidated that. And actually we've seen statistics even with the art world. So in a way, popular culture and the high culture is a sort of like a artificial binary because they have a lot more in common in terms of mo monopolies than we'd like to believe. Yeah, talking about monopolies, Netflix is, is, is you might say it has a monopoly position. Absolutely. Uh, to what extent are you optimistic about, for example, platforms like IFFR Unleashed, which is a very small niche platform IFFR has introduced a couple of years ago where you can watch art house movies that have been, have been on the festival. Um, what do you think? Well, I mean, you know what they say is there's always like this sort of a um, uh, dead zone around these massive monopolies. So the question is, how long is that going to last? Is it going to be bought over by one of these mega monopolies? You know, it's just, is it a matter of time before they absorb it into their system? And as you've seen with other technologies like Skype, which has, I have to say, gone into crap like mode because it got bought over, right? Like a lot of these companies which are thriving and do well and create a niche, land up getting absorbed and become sort of like mediocre, you know? And so my concern is, I wonder if that's gonna be the fate because we see it time and again. At the same time, you know, there is still room for these kind of initiatives of course, that are yeah. popping up. But yes, so if they become too visible and successful, they do get, or they end up being bought up. Yeah. Uh, your, your book, The Next Billion Users, um, could you say something about these, who are these next billion users and to what extent are they subject of the same discussion we are uh, having here? Well, um, when I was writing this book, 
what I had in mind is because I've been in the field, um, I deal with um, a lot of people outside the West, particularly low-income communities. And what I found, and actually this really ties to Martine's uh, presentation, is that um, people actually have this perception that, uh, of course, if you're low income, your needs are so different and so exotic from the normal, which means you wouldn't obviously consume entertainment when you should be thinking about food and shelter, when actually they are high consumers of media content. They're constant consumers because they're often unemployed and it keeps their morale up. They're always listening to music. You go to any part, whether it's in Mexico, you go to Peru, anywhere, their music is always on, they're constantly sharing films. It doesn't matter if they don't have access, they make it happen through Bluetooth, through a lot of, so my argument here is, we know for a fact that the market is outside the West in terms of just sheer young people. 85% of the young people are outside the West. Majority of them are living in low-income settings, and they all have some kind of access to these devices. Mobile penetration is 100%. You know, so we are yet sort of condescendingly looking at them as non-users. Mm -hmm. Media companies are not taking them seriously. They don't cater to them as legitimate consumers. And if anything, they rile up about piracy and the sharing of you know, illegal goods when one film costs their monthly wage. So if you're not going to propose alternative business models to these users, that is the norm, not the exotic then you are not only missing a business opportunity, you, it's l literally, you're criminalizing these people on things which are so basic and humane and which actually motivates people on a day-by-day -day basis, yeah. right? Um, just uh, for people in the audience, do you have some highbrow uh, Netflix advice? What to watch? <laughs> We watched the, I watched the movie Roma, uh, you know. Which, Roma, okay, uh, which was recommended to you. Which was recommended uh, to me, but well, not to her. So, but <laughs> but, you but did, we did watch yeah, it in India together. He, he did, uh, make, he did uh, increase my, my intellectual capacity by sharing his taste with me. So okay. I have risen to a different category, I hope. So. <laughs> thanks, <laughs> thanks for being here. Yeah, her book is on sale, I think, at the end of this month, right? Next end of next month, yeah. Next month, yeah. okay. Give, uh, given out by Harvard University Press. Uh, by you. Aurora and Philip Vermeijen. Thanks Thank for being you. here. Thank you.